Good morning, everyone. I want you to join me in welcoming Liam Casey to, to DLD. It's his first DLD appearance, so thank you for joining us, Liam. Good to be here. <laughs> The amazing thing about Liam is that he moved from Ireland to China 20 years ago. He knew about China and what was going to happen there almost before anyone. And Liam, um, I'd say that PCH to a lot of people isn't necessarily a household name, but you have customers who include almost all the world's tech giants. Apple, Beats, Xiaomi, one more, many we don't know. Can you, can you just briefly describe what you do in your factories and how you're changing shipping and tech? Yep, well, great to be here. Um, so we take products from concept all the way through to consumer, and that means you know we get involved at the design stage. We don't do industrial design. Our customers usually have their own industrial design, but then we take it to the next stage, which is the product development stage, all the way through to the design for manufacturing, the actual manufacturing where we actually manage that whole um, production process, and then the packaging, and also the logistics to move it to wherever it needs to go anywhere in the world. And we also have a distribution business and a, an e-commerce business as well. So we look at the, the entire end-to-end -end of global commerce. Now, it used to be when, when something was made in China, it would take you know, weeks. Uh, companies would have to build up inventories. How, how long does it take you now to get product from your factories to consumers? You know, we operate on the basis that we're three hours from every factory we work with, and we're three days from 90% of the consumers on the planet that so buy products. So even Africa, India... So 90% of the consumers that would actually buy the products which we move, you can actually get it there within three days. And again, you know, this is a small planet, and a lot of people don't, you know, we don't think about that, you know, but if you can send a parcel to the International Space Station in six hours, then you don't need a lot of warehouses around the world for holding inventory, and especially the kind of products which we work with. We work with high-tech companies that develop uh, consumer electronic products that are, you know, fast-moving, um, and again, with the cycles in the product development, they happen so fast in today's world mm -hmm. that you, you do not want to be sitting on any inventory. Mm -hmm. Can we go a bit more into that? There, Xiaomi and some of the Chinese companies especially, they, they've kind of developed this specialty almost in just-in-time ordering where, where they, they are really finely attuned to demand, whereas many Western companies have traditionally built up a lot of inventory. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the Western companies still build to forecast. And again, in some cases, you do need to build some forecast. But when you look at the Chinese companies that are actually shipping direct, and they're actually batch production, building batch production and then batch selling, um, and they operate on the basis of sell and buy, not buy and sell, the way they, the way they work and the way they think. Um, and again, if we sit with a company, in, a Western company outside of China, and we tell them that we're going to ship their product directly from our fulfillment center in China, um, they'll say, no, 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 we need, you need to have warehouses around the world to hold the inventory. And we tell them, no, you don't. Um, if we were to enter a conversation with a Chinese company and say we were going to put product into a warehouse around the world, they would they'd kill the meeting. It would end the meeting. Because they, 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 they see inventory as being evil, whereas a lot of the Western companies still think they want to see it, touch it, play with it, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure it's there. Um, which is like, that's, that has to change. And again, when we look at the way, I mean, there are some, uh, some of the public companies in the consumer electronic space that we look at, and we look at their numbers, and they have between 75 and 120 days of inventory. And these are consumer electronic products, uh, Silicon Valley based. Um, and that's up to 120 days of inventory. When you look at the Chinese guys, they've got positive cash flow. They've got zero inventory. They literally, the product comes in only when the product is sold. It only comes off the line when it's sold. And again, that's possible. There's no reason why the Western companies can't do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Change in thinking. And so that just requires an enormous amount of capital that is basically sitting there. And if consumer tastes change, then then they're stuck with the inventory. Yeah, and again, it also reflects, and you look at the ownership structures of a lot of the, um, the Chinese companies, usually the entrepreneur owns 80% of the company after multiple funding rounds. Mm -hmm. you, look at the, the, you look at the Western companies and the, the founders don't own any of it. Right. They're down to like single digit equity, like really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of it's gone to fund the inventory. Um, and the inventory is something that in today's world, I mean, we, we try to place uh, inventory with data. 
if you can get live data from real-time sales that are happening around the world, and you can in today's world, um, you actually can manage the supply chain in a much more lean way. And it's interesting because when we look at um, some of the changes happening in the whole supply chain and what we do, we actually think that the, the changes are happening, they're happening, you know, that'll happen in the next three to five years, will be just utilizing existing technology that's already at play, but not being utilized properly. Um, and you know, we're 20 years in business this year. Um, we're really excited about the next 20, but that the, the, the we see huge change happening in the first three to five years of that. You showed me earlier that, uh, a slide where you can track um, inventory real time from stores in the US to fulfillment centers in China, and all yeah. of this can be done. Oh yeah, in today's world, it's like, you know, Tracking data, tracking a, tr tracking a product is almost as easy as tracking a tweet. You know? um, it's in today's world, the, the, t the technology is there to do it. So you're, you, you specialize in the first mile and the last mile. Tell me, in San Francisco now, you're, you're trying to, to help bridge the gap between Silicon Valley and China. And so, so you're working with more companies to design the product to get it to manufacture much faster than, than previously? Yeah, uh, two years ago we opened a product innovation hub in San Francisco where we actually put in a, a large engineering presence. Um, and we also have our Highway 1 um, accel accelerator there as well. And both of these have just brought great focus to, the, to, to hardware and what's possible and how we interact with the um, with the companies, whether it's the startups or whether it's with the, the large tech companies, or even now we're finding a lot of companies that are not historically utilizing tech in their business that want to, um, to get, if they're you know, a leader in their category, they don't want to lose, they don't want to give up uh, the category lead. And they're now starting to use technology right throughout their business and they're looking at how to create connected devices in their space or you know, whether it's wearables, whether it's um, the Internet of Things. Um, they're looking to embrace this and how do they do it. They, they've seen, I think, you know, with our Highway 1 initiative, creating a lot of the startups that play in these spaces, I think a lot of the bigger companies have come to us because they think, or they can see that we've done a lot of work in this area and that you know, we kind of know how to, to produce these products and to do it in a capital efficient way. So last week you announced a major agreement with L'Oreal, a beauty company. They're not traditionally seen as a tech leader, but, um, but you d you've designed a UV patch that is apparently half the length of a human hair. And, and maybe describe the, the uh, partnership with them yeah. and uh, where you think it's going to go. You know, this for us is a really exciting partnership. Um, we, we engaged with L'Oreal about a year and a half ago, and you know, just in that 18 month period, from watching them, it's become clear to us that the beauty industry and the cosmetics sector today is exactly where the music sector was in 2001, uh, when music was being developed, delivered on a cassette player. Um, and then the MP3 came along and the iPod, um, and that changed everything. And we think the beauty industry, we think that using um, connected devices, IoT, and how cosmetics will be delivered in the future and personalized and customized in the future is, is all about to change. Um, so we were thrilled you know, to you know, find a company like L'Oreal, who is a leader in their category, and to, to, to work with them. Um, we look at the, you know, the first product which we announced was a, um, it's a UV patch that uh, detects UV um, sun intake to the body, and it's, you know, it's connected, it's got an app, um, it actually, you know, it's got an NFC circuit in it as well. Um, so it connects to your phone, you take a photograph, it gives you a reading from the, from the patch, it will tell you uh, how much sun you've taken in it. It will w give you signals to uh, apply sun, sun um, protection. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that's the first one. And again, you know, working with a company like L'Oreal on a project like this, that has a huge impact. You know, to me, that patch, I think, has a much bigger impact than a connected toaster. So it's, it's, it's something that really excites us. How long did it take in the development process? From I, I assume they worked with you in, in San Francisco. You're manufacturing it in China. Yeah, that one was more, the biggest challenge on that product was around the construction. There was you know, multiple layers of material. Uh, the thickness is, I guess, half a micro, or it's um, but half the thickness of a, a human hair. Um, so to get all of the layers stacked was and to get it to function was, was at, and to make it in an environment that it was, you know, scalable um, was hugely important for them. Mm -hmm. 
But you think that uh, going from now that you're able to shrink the development time? Oh, yeah. For, for that, that's a pretty straightforward one. I mean, some of the other products which we're working with are probably more reflective of the, par the partnership. There's a lot more electronics. Um, there's more mechanical work involved in it. So they're probably more reflective of, what, of the work we do, which is exciting. You were telling me that you were walking around CES and thinking of all the startups that were just packed there and how a lot of them probably won't succeed. Can you, can you kind of, uh, if you were to give advice, you deal with startups all the time, what, what, you know, a good idea isn't quite enough anymore? No, and I think, look, the barrier to entry for hardware has really come down, or the barrier to entry for prototypes has come down quite a lot. Um, and, you know, when we look at uh, a startup in the hardware world, we think about um, three things. People, you know, use PCB, you know, which in the hardware world is normally printed circuit board. What we think about is the product, company, and business. And you can have a great product, but you need to have a great company, which is building a great team. Um, and then the, the other part is just making sure you've got a great business, making sure you can get sales and the product sells and that there's a market for it. Um, and they're the things that, you know, we put more focus around the company and the business than the product. The product, because... You know, as I said, the barrier to entry for prototyping has really gone away. And you can see great presentations and great prototypes. You know, two years ago, if you turned up to a VC in Silicon Valley with a prototype that worked, you probably had a good chance of convincing them. You know, they did their diligence and all that, but you, had, you, you went a long way towards um, convincing them to, to, to consider investing. Whereas in today's world, you know, everybody has prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, and so... It's really looking, it's now down to, and, and our whole ambition when it came to setting up Highway 1 and, you know, to create the startups, we wanted to ensure that the only barrier to entry for an entrepreneur or an engineer who wanted to build a hardware company was their ambition to do it. Um, but it wasn't all of the other things that can go wrong. Now, there are lots of challenges in hardware that you don't see in, in the software world. So if you're, if you're choosing which startups to work with, um, what is the... What is the pitfall that, you know, so they have the prototype, what is the thing they need to do to stand out that's going to that's gonna get them to the next level? So for us, what we look for is we look for an A team, and then if it's, you know, we like an A product, but if it's a B product, we'll work with them and help them improve it, but always an A team, and it's the coherence of the team and their ability to work together as a team. Um, you know, if you look at Y Combinant, they've got this chart in, um, which shows the growth of a startup, and it's got this hockey stick, but very early on in the hockey stick, there's a, um, there's a, 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 a blip, and I think they call it the TechCrunch blip, is when TechCrunch writes about you and you, uh, you get this um, you know, spike in demand and all of a sudden your servers crash. Um, and then what happens is the team actually go into a huddle and they actually sprint and they actually repair it and get it back up and eventually they take off. In the hardware world, that's very different because you've got everything from the prototype blip to the, um, the you know, change in component blip, the tooling blip, the regulatory blip, the wrong label, shipping blip. So there's so many different things can go wrong. And it's interesting, you know, it's just having the, the patience and the understanding, the attention to detail, and the paranoia around perfection is so important. Mm -hmm. And that is something, you know, some, some of the, you know, when you look at, you know, all it takes is one of those things to go wrong. And you, I mean, if you're not well coordinated as a team, those things will put you out of business. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier, and, and L'Oreal is part of a wave you're seeing of just a ton of, of interest from companies that aren't traditional tech companies. Do you, do you see that um, expanding and, and accelerating in the coming year? So, so in a sense, startups now are also competing against giants. Uh, the CEO of Airbus was here yesterday. Uh, L'Oreal, the car companies, everybody is scrambling to do tech. Yeah, I think in the traditional... Um, large non-tech companies, we are seeing a lot of interest from those companies. As you say, a company like L'Oreal a couple of years ago wouldn't have been that interested in, involved, in getting involved in tech, but they, they opened an incubator in Silicon Valley, which kind of really got our attention. They opened a, a product innovation incubator in San Francisco, and that for us sent a very good signal that this is a company that really wants to embrace tech. Um, and then... Um, you know, what, what, what we like about it is that they understand their market. They know the kind of products. They have all the data. They know what sells and what doesn't sell. Um, the, 
so, and that's the benefit of working with companies that are established in the marketplace, that know the consumer, that actually have a brand in, in, in the marketplace. A company like L'Oreal that has over 40 brands for us, you know, what they bring to us is distribution. And it doesn't matter whether you're building a software company or you're building a hardware company, the number one thing you're looking for is distribution of a product and how to get it to a consumer um, and up to millions of consumers. Um, and that's what a company like L'Oreal bring. They bring a very um, established channel to market. Um, but we're seeing a lot more uh, companies in that category, in, the, in that space that are um, you know, large non-tech companies that want to embrace technology. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, you're on the ground in Shenzhen, China. How does it feel? Um, there's, uh, you know, the rest of the world, everybody's become a bear on China. The market turmoil there is, is rattling um, markets everywhere else. Um, are people uh, feeling pessimistic? No, I mean, again, when we look at China, we've been operating there 20 years. Um, the... You know, for us, we operate on the basis of, you know, we're comfortable with less information because we've operated there so long. <laughs> we went in there. I spent the first two years alone there. So it was, it was, then I started to build up a team once I had a little bit of understanding. But the one thing about China is you're never really going to understand everything. And, you know, you hear, you see lots of people write books about it and all that, you know, but really, I mean, I don't think you've, you've been there and, you know, I don't think um, anyone really knows that completely about China and what happens there. Um, for us, We've been, I think, you know, we've built a great team on the ground there. We've been very fortunate to do that. Um, we've been lucky as well that, you know, we've got customers that actually, you know, come to us and they, 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 they know exactly what they want. It makes it easy for us to, to deliver that for them. But I think when I look at, you know, you hear all these stories about empty factories and all that, on the theory of... Room, uh, of replacing inventory with data. If you've got accurate data for product that's selling, um, you're not going to need to produce as much product. And this is part of our sustainability program. You know, we look at the more accurate data you have, the less inventory you put into warehouses, the less energy you need to produce that excess product that's never going to sell. And China is reacting to that, and the whole world is reacting to that. Um, a lot of our customers now are saying, okay, we'll give you tighter information that's more accurate about production. That means you need less production space. And that's a, that's a global trend, and it's not a China thing. Mm -hmm. I think China is probably reacting to it. Mm -hmm. But if orders for, say, iPhones are sl slowing, and I know you don't want to be specific about customers, but, you know, and, and demand is, is, is drying up, I mean, it must feel, it can't be good, ultimately, for the companies if, um, if, if demand is slowing, if growth is slowing. Or do you think that what's happening with tech is so, f is no, so fundamentally uh, large that, that, it, that it will all... I think out. When, I mean, for us, and I think we've been very close to a lot of this, when I look at the companies like the Chinese companies that produce product, literally produce product, and like within 24 hours, it's on a plane destined for a consumer. And there is no... Like, it already has the consumer's name on the product. And there's nothing... There's no warehouse, no distribution, nothing in between. To me, that takes so much waste and it takes so much of the buffer out of the system that inevitably um, you're going to have less production. Um, and I actually think it's long term, it's better. It's a painful transition through that journey, but I think long term it, is, it works out better. So you think some of the economic pressures actually might force people to, to be smarter about how they manage their... They have to be. I mean, again, when I look at the, when you look at the waste in a Chinese company versus some of the excess waste in some of the, the you know, Western companies, the difference is huge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, the Chinese companies that we work with, they literally sell and buy, and, like, they'll build 100,000 products, and before it comes into our packaging center where we pack it, that will actually be sold. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we look at some of the other companies we work with, and they'll give you an order um, for... 100,000 products, and you ship it into a warehouse, and you kind of sit back and see if it sells. And that in itself is a, is a huge challenge for any of the companies that are trying to fund it. Mm -hmm. And just quickly before we wrap up, um, the, the pressure in the China tech scene is probably more intense than it is even in Silicon Valley. Um, 
valuations are falling. Um, do you think the Chinese have made real inroads in innovating? From you know, what you see? in some cases, yes. But at the end of the day, you know, and this is where we see this great opportunity for some of the Western companies we work with. In there's a, 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 a an area in the city in Shenzhen where we operate, and it's called Huachung Bay, and it's the electronics market, and I would say that there's somewhere in the region of a thousand new products a day coming on the market there. And at the end of the day, it's how do you kind of, what's the story behind your company? How do you edit? How do you curate? How do you tell that story? And that's what's really important. And how do you get the attention of consumers? And some companies make that and some companies don't. Um, you look at companies like OnePlus in China, they've really been successful in getting their name out there. Um, and again, they operate on this um, model of batch production and batch selling. And the product sells out all the time. And there's usually demand. The first, their first product, I think, was the last phone that they sold. I think the, the product sold for about $300. I think the first one sold on eBay for $6,000. Hmm. Now, when you compare that to Amazon launching the Fire Phone and the product like sitting in warehouses and not selling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. same product. Thanks very much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.